So the sermon tonight, I'm hoping, is going to be an encouragement to you that are here. Especially for those of you visiting, you're lucky it's not going to be some hard railing on some sin, ripping your face off type of sermon. Uh, we get plenty of those here, but tonight it's going to be more, uh, hopefully, um, helpful in a different way, helpful in trying to, to encourage and admonish and, and help you sustain your Christian life and your Christian growth. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen in a person's life when you decide to follow the Lord. And I'll just, uh, say this right off the bat, you know, nobody's life is perfect. Amen. And as we read this morning, Jesus Christ said, be ye perfect, right? And, and, and he wants us to be perfect. He wants us to be complete, but he, wa he wants us to obey his commandments. And we exalt the commandments of the Lord. We exalt the Lord, the, the, the law of the Lord. We love the law, right? We want to follow the law. And we want those around us to have the same type of heart and mentality. We respect God's law. We want to be as perfect as possible. But let's face it, we're not perfect. And oftentimes, especially in, in the hardcore, fundamental Baptist churches, You might have a tendency to see people where that looks like they've got everything together and everything's great, but behind the scenes, it's not. There's problems, maybe problems with the family, problems with other family members, problems with your kids, pro you know, problems at work, whatever the case may be. And you might feel like you're all alone looking around and being like, well, everyone else has their act together, why don't I? Well, I'll tell you this much, and from my experience, even being a pastor and, you know, talking to people, a lot of people have a lot of problems, okay? And I say that so you know that, one, you're not alone, but we don't want to just get so soft in this sense of like, well, everyone has problems, so none of this is really a big deal, because it is. And we ought to be able to look at ourselves and judge ourselves and and, um, you know, do our best to, to overcome the problems. But don't feel like, the, you know, when you have a problem that no one's ever gone through it before. And the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because the Christian life can be hard. It can be difficult. And the more sold out you are to really follow Christ, to be a disciple, to change your life, to do things different, it's going to bring heat on yourself. It's going to, you know, people aren't going to treat you the same anymore. It might cost you your job. It might cost you relationships. It might cause people to not want to have anything to do with you. And that's not always easy to deal with. Right. Let's be real. It's not. It can be very difficult. But one thing that you can know for certain is that if you are doing things that you know that God wants you to do and God can see your heart and you are going in the right direction, that no matter what you go through in this life, you will never have to face something that you are not going to be capable of getting through. The title of the sermon this evening is Above That Ye Are Able. And I draw that from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Stay in Exodus. I'm going to read this verse for you. Very popular verse. Great verse. The Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That means there's a lot of temptations that are common to man. It's not just you. People go through a lot of trials and temptations and problems in their life. Everybody goes through problems. My life isn't perfect. I know your life isn't perfect. We all deal with different things. But I know that there's no temptation taken you, such as a common man, but God is faithful. And this is what we want to remember throughout this whole sermon. I want to get, get, keep coming back to this concept. God is faithful. God knows you. God knows what you go through. God knows how our flesh is. God knows what we deal with. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Temptations will come. Trials come. Persecutions come your way. 
But no matter what you face, no matter how bleak things appear to be in a moment, in a given period of time, you can know that you will get through those things because God won't allow you to suffer, uh, to be tempted above that you're able. He says, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So you need to keep your eyes open for the way to escape, right? It's not God's fault if you don't choose to get out, you know, to, to escape that temptation and to get out of there when he's provided the way for you. If you decide to continue on and you get yourself into your own problems, then that, that, that promise is gone, right? But he's faithful to make sure you, you're going to have a way out. Whatever your struggle is, whatever your problem is, whatever trial it is that comes your way, there will always be a way out. And if you're going through something that seems to be extremely difficult and you don't know, you feel like you're at your wit's end, I don't know if I could take this anymore, you can. You can. You just have to push a little bit more. Let's take a look. We, we see these examples with the children of Israel in the book of Exodus. We're going to see a couple of stories here that illustrate what I'm trying to teach this evening and, and the, the, the comfort that we can get in knowing the way that God works. We have the children of Israel just at, and what we, where we started here in Exodus 13, this is like just as they come out of Egypt, okay? They've been under a lot of stress. They've been slaves. They've been worked to the bone. They've had the threat of Pharaoh and being slaves and bond servants to these Egyptians that are not treating them very well. They see the miracles performed by God through Moses they finally escape. They see the, the Egyptians destroyed in the Red Sea. And they're rejoicing. Great news. But God also knows that they're not very stable yet. They haven't had time to really grow. They've had a lot of doubts. They, even though they've seen so much, they're still very weak. And God knows that they're weak. But they're following him, they're following his will, they're following Moses, the direction that God wants them to go. So what he does when he's leading them up, because what's he doing? He's leading them to the promised land. He's leading them to this great place. But there's a few different ways to get there. And the most direct path was going to be a very scary one. And there was going to involve maybe a war and some fighting, and the people at that time would not have been able to bear it. And God knew this, so he brings them about another way. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near, see, that was closer. He could have just brought them that way. But he chose not to, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. God's bringing them on this journey. He's bringing them on this path. They haven't gotten to the destination yet. They're still very early on in their journey. We can equate this maybe to your Christian life. Maybe you're a babe in Christ. You're very early on and if too many things happen at once, it can just cause you to just be like, well, forget all this. I'm going back to Egypt. I'm going back to the world. And he knew that with these people. So he says, okay, knowing that that's the case, I don't want to have them have this temptation above that they're able to bear. So we're going to go this way. It may be a little bit longer road. It has its own challenges. But just knowing and being able to trust that God can see the road ahead. And that wherever you are on your road, the key is as long as you're going according to the way God would have you to go, and, and I don't mean that in some mysterious way, I mean that in the sense of where your heart is in serving God. Where your heart is in trying to, you know, get sin out of your life and do what he wants you to do and go to church and read your Bible and go soul winning and pray and all these various things that you know are right to do. And God, because you're and you're going the right direction. 
You're not perfect, but, but you're, go, you're trying to go the right direction. Then we know that God will lead you in a path that isn't going to destroy you, that isn't going to kill you, that isn't going to make you just have to say, well, forget it all. I can't do this. It's too hard. Because he won't allow that to happen. It says in verse 18, But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Harnessed, I believe, there means like they're ready for war. You know, they're, they're kind of go out prepared to fight, but God knew they really weren't up for the battle. So they're, they've gone up, and they've gone around to avoid that conflict with the Philistines. And you know what? They avoided it for the time being. It doesn't mean that that battle isn't going to come. It just means they weren't prepared and ready for it at that time. Because the battle did come. But at, by that point, they're ready for it. By that point, they're prepared. And we need to keep this in our remembrance. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 19. We need to keep this in our remembrance. Because there are times in our life that can seem scary. When you're dealing with the unknown, when you're dealing with the future, I don't know what the future holds. I know I'm facing a lot of things right now that, that, are, that I don't know what's going to happen. And you can be fearful. And you can feel alone. And in 1 Kings 19, we see another example of a very godly man, someone who is going the right way, someone who is heeding the call that God had in his life. but felt very alone. Felt like he was the only one going through it and got to a point to where he was ready to throw up his hands and just say, I can't do this anymore, Lord. But there's something for us to learn from these experiences. Look at verse number one in 1 Kings 19. Of course, I'm talking about Elijah. I'm talking about a great man of God. I mean, there are very few, I think, that it can compare to an Elijah. As far as great men of the Bible, one of the very few that are just, just great examples through and through of a great prophet of God. But he was human. He was a person. He, suffer, he, he, he was subject to light, like temptations as we are. You know, read the book of James. Elijah, Elisha, these men, yeah, they're great prophets, but they were men. Don't forget that. I think God puts a lot of stuff in the Bible so that we don't forget that, so we don't idolize any one person. They all have their flaws. They all have their problems. Some of them have really serious problems. But they still chose to go the right way. They still were able to, to do what was right and be greatly used of God. But let's see a little bit in the life of Elijah here in verse number 1 there, chapter 19. The Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And this is one of my favorite stories in chapter 18. Where, where it's this showdown between him and the prophets of Baal, right? And they both have to have their sacrifices. And he says, well, the God that answers by fire, that's the true God. And the Baal worshippers are all cutting themselves and crawling out and speaking in tongues and doing whatever it is that they do to try to get a hold of their false God unsuccessfully. And then, of course, Elijah comes. He's dumping a bunch of water all over and being like, all right, you want to see something? Do you want to see how, God, how the true God works? It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with, with even physics. I'm going to douse all this stuff, drench it in water. And God consumes it all and licks up the, the last little bit of water with a, the with a fire that comes down from heaven. And, and great victory, right? And then he's like, you know, Elijah commands that the, the, Baal, the prophets of Baal are put to death and all this stuff happens, right? Well, then Ahab runs along and tells his wicked lot wife and reports back to her all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, verse number two, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, You'll see this happen many times in Scripture when there's this great victory, this great result. Oh, man, look how God worked. Look at all these prophets of Baal are put to death, and everything seems to be going great. 
that all of a sudden there's this big temptation or this big downside after your, your, your big high, right? And this happens many times and we need to be aware of this. And there's a good reason for this to happen because when you start really getting victory after victory for the Lord and seem to be going really well, you know what? That makes some people angry. Like our adversary, Satan, doesn't like to see that. He wants to kill that momentum and stop you from doing any more. So he needs to throw up a stumbling block. He needs to throw up a roadblock to try to get you to quit, to try to get you to question yourself, to try to get you to give up. See, Satan can't force you to give up. And that's the beauty. That, 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 therein lies the real power is that he doesn't have the power to make you do anything. You're born again, child of God. He can't possess you. He can't take over. He can't control you. All he can do is scare you and use many tactics to try to get through to you and scare you. But ultimately, you have the choice. And the only way to truly fail in your Christian life is to give up and quit and to just say, forget it all. For what, and it doesn't matter what the reason is. You give up and quit, you fail. Elijah has this great victory. Everything's going wonderful. And then all of a sudden, he gets this death threat. And it's a credible death threat. It's not just like, you know, the people on the internet that don't like the way you preach against the homos that just want, oh, I'm going to do this to you. And Eddie is like, yeah, the keyboard warriors, you're not worried about those threats. We know what those are. This was a viable threat. This was someone in charge. This is, this is a wicked person that's already had people put to death just because they wanted a vineyard. Very wicked people. This would be like getting a death threat from the Clintons, right? <laughs> you, don't, you, you, don't, you don't mess around with that. I mean, this is literally probably a very, very close analogy. Talk about political power and criminals and criminality and murderers. You're going to take that kind of serious. So he does. He, he actually, this, this upsets him and it scares him and it, and it forces him to run away. And it's interesting how that works because he obviously had the power of God on him to do all this great work and, and to have all that great success. It wasn't him and he knows it wasn't like his own power that caused all that stuff to happen. But sometimes when we're faced with, with you know, death or with something very severe, it can cause us to lose our, some of our better judgment. Or cause us to just be so stressed out that we don't want to deal with it anymore. And that was the case that happened with Elijah. It's not, I don't think he just lost his faith in God. I think he knew that God is all powerful, but I think he just got to this point of, you know, God, I've been dealing with this and dealing with this and dealing with this and I've been on the run and I've been hiding and there's been droughts and there's been all this stuff and I've really been uncomfortable and, and I don't think I could take this anymore. I don't think I could take one more attack. And that's why he says here in verse number uh, four, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. He wants to give up and die. He said, God, just take me. God, I can't do this anymore. God, I'm not better than anyone else. And, and I think he's feeling down even more on himself for having run away and now he's just kind of scared and he's just feeling like, you know what, God, I'm not as strong as people think I am. I'm not as strong as my fathers were. I'm not good. I don't measure up. Now, did Elijah measure up? Yeah. I would say, yeah. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But that's not how he viewed himself. That's not how he felt. He felt, God, I'm ready to die. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm worthless. I'm not good. But what does God do? Does God just say, yeah, you're right. I'll just kill you now. No, of course not. Of course not. He strengthens him. Let's, let's keep reading here. Verse number five. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time. So not just one time does he send an angel to minister unto him, 
to help him, to strengthen him, to give him food, to give him sustenance, he does it twice. So the second time an angel comes and touches him and says, Rise, eat, because the journey is too great for thee. So God's preparing him for another journey. He feels like he want, wants to die, but he didn't die. He's getting through it. It's difficult. It's a trial. It's uncomfortable, and it's not fun. But he, God knows what he's capable of enduring, and he's able to get through this, and now he's preparing him for this journey that he has to go on. And God is providing the preparation for him. He sent the angel to help him to get prepared with this physical food, with this meal, so he, his body can actually take the journey that he's about to take and, uh, and, and get through yet another trial. Look at verse number 8. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights on the whore of the mount of God. So in the strength of that meat means that food. He didn't eat along the way. He didn't stop at a diner and pick up another meal or drive through McDonald's or anything like that. He, he, he had that food that was given to him in the beginning, and he went 40 days and 40 nights in his journey to get to his destination. So yeah, not, not, a, not a pleasant, not a, neat, not a fun journey. I don't know about you. I mean, I, I love taking road trips, but I like stopping and taking breaks and getting some food too. You know, it's, it's a whole other story to go for over a month without eating. Right. That's sink in. That's, I mean, those are, and, and you know, this is, I wasn't even going to cover this, but we have, I mean, it's literally, we have first world problems. Yeah. Oh, my cell phone's getting turned off. Oh, I don't have internet. Oh, I'm in Facebook jail. Oh, you know, like, <laughs> that's not persecution at all. Not even close. Yet people get so upset over these stupid things. Let's actually take a look at what people really faced when they faced persecution. Now, you know, it, it is kind of funny, but we ought to be prepared. We ought to have our hearts ready because if we're going to serve the Lord, we need to be ready that these, th these types of things can happen in our day, in our time. They, maybe they will. Maybe the Antichrist will be coming into power soon and we'll be the ones, you know, running for our lives. Right. When the, the commandment comes down from on high, from the Antichrist saying, yeah, let's go out and kill those Christians. We need to be strengthened. Let's get strengthened now before it just comes up on you and you're not ready for it. And, and maintain the, the, the right mindset when you do have trials and tribulations and problems in your life, put it in perspective. How bad is it really? And, you know, the, the, some of the, a lot of stuff I preach obviously is close to home to me. There's things that are going on in my life that, that maybe prompt me to preach certain sermons because it, it's, right, it's on my mind. It's something I think about a lot, right? And in this case, I've been dealing with, uh, with not, not having a, a job, but... Um, you know, it can be scary and, 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 you know, cause some anxiety at times, but I don't look at my problem as a very difficult one just because of the way that God's blessed me in so many other ways. I mean, I, I think about, I look at what people went through here. I look at how Jeremiah was cast in a dungeon. I look at how people went through some real persecution and stuff. And like, I'm not going through anything close to that. And, it, and, it's, and it's hard to even imagine what that is, and, and I, I almost feel bad even being concerned to the point that I have been with, with, with finding employment in some ways because the, it's so far removed from what people had to go through, and we need, we need to keep a perspective on that, that and, and be very humble and thankful for things that you do have in your life, even when things aren't going you know, to plan. They're not going the way that you think they should go. You know, that's not the time to say, oh man, I, I, don't, I can't deal with this. I'm going to give up or something like that. You know, it's... We need the perspective and we get it here with Elijah. Look at verse number, um, number nine. It says, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. 
And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He's in a very serious situation. I mean, there are a lot of people that are children of Israel that, he said, he's right, they forsook the covenant. They had nothing to do with the Lord. He's the only one willing to stand up. Now, he wasn't the only one, we'll see that in a minute, but he was the only one willing to stand up for the Lord and be on the Lord's side when everyone else is seemingly just on Baal's side. And they're breaking down altars. They're killing prophets. I mean, his life, it was legitimately in danger. We don't know what that's like living in the United States of America. I'm able to get up here freely and preach without worry about someone, you know, arresting me and chopping my head off. It's a whole nother ball game when you have some serious pressure to face to, to that degree. And I'm not saying I want to go through that, but we need to our, do our best to try to, to, to realize that and, and make that sink in. Because the time may come, and we need to be as prepared as we possibly can. Jump down to verse number 14 here in 1 Kings 19. The Bible says, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he repeats himself when God asks him what he's doing there. Verse number 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Maholam, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha say, say, slay. So God's giving him not only a mission, you know, another, another work to do, but he's also now giving him a little bit more information and insight about what's going to happen. He's saying, okay, this person's going to be in charge, you know, and things are going to be taken care of in this way and gives him a little bit more info to kind of help him along and to strengthen him to, to continue doing the work that he has. And then he follows up with this in verse 18. He says, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which have not kissed him. And that's important, and that's good to know, because knowing, just knowing that you're not alone really does a lot to, to encourage and edify and to strengthen you. And let me say this, this is one of, one of the many reasons, but one very important reason why church is so important. Making sure you are in a church for the rest of your life is going to be vital. Don't take the option when you come to crossroads in your life and you got some job prospect or some other prospect coming up that's going to take you out of an assembly and don't think for a second that you're going to keep up your level of spirituality when you do not have a church to support you. We saw this morning in Romans chapter 10 you know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear of him? Then who, um, how shall they, they preach unto them unless they be sent? And it says that um, they need to be sent. And who's doing the sending if you're off by yourself? It's not happening. The local assembly is important. We need to, to, to provoke one another unto love and the good works, it says in Hebrews chapter 10. So I says, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need, we need, to, be, we need to be here to provoke one another, to, to, to help one another. Jer Elijah thought he was alone. He wanted to die. You put yourself in a situation where you're off alone, and then you, 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 know, and you start off good. You're going the right way. You want to serve God. You face persecution, you might end up feeling alone and want to die and quit. Being in a congregation helps you 
to know that you're not alone. It gives you that support. Being in a good church where people are on board and in one place with one accord, one mindset, like-minded believers, together you care for one another, you pray for one another, you look out for one another, and you encourage one another. And we need it. We, if, 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 a, if a man like Elijah needed it, I think we need it. I don't compare myself to these guys that, that, are, that, that faced so much and did so much for the Lord and think that I'm better than them. Right. Well, I can handle way more. I'm a tougher guy. I'm tougher than Elijah. I'm tougher than John the Baptist. I'm tougher than these great men of God who all had doubts when they were segregated and put off by themselves. John the Baptist, when he was cast in the prison, started having doubts. Are you the one that, that we're looking for or do we look for another? He was isolated. We need that encouragement. Stay in church. Come to church. Come to church regularly. We need it so much the more, especially as the love of many waxes cold. But the Lord, the Lord assures him. He says, I've got 7,000. Where were those 7,000? I mean, it's good to know that they're there. It's very encouraging. It's, you know, hey, wow, well, there's 7,000. Praise God. But where were they when he needed them? They're skipping church. Turn if you would back to Exodus. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 15 in just a few minutes. We cannot allow fear of the unknown cause you to make bad decisions. And that's the way it is when you, when you, when you live the Christian life. God doesn't illuminate your path for like the whole way. When you're, when you're walking by faith and not by sight, we have the Bible, we have the law, we have the principles to follow. He gives us wisdom to know right from wrong. We understand what some good goals are, some good endpoints, but we don't see the path that we need to take to get to that endpoint. We usually see the light in front of our feet of here's your next step. It could be unnerving or unsettling to not know so what's going on. But just because you may be facing things that can try to cause doubt or fear in you, we cannot allow ourselves to have that fear or have that doubt force us into, or not force us, but, but lead us into making a bad decision. Maintaining principle, maintaining what's right. It's easy to preach about, you know, what's right and what's true when everything's going well for you, right? It's easy, it's easy to preach, well, you need to have faith in God when you're not facing any trials or troubles, isn't it? I mean, Oh man, you got to have this faith and you know, we can look at the children. Oh man, they were so bad and they, you know, they murmured and they complained and all this other stuff and I can't believe they would do all these things when you're fed really well, when you've got this warm house and air conditioning and all the comforts in the world. You know, it's really easy to say, oh yeah, you people don't have enough faith. Now, you ought to have the faith and it, just because God blesses you doesn't make your faith any less significant or doesn't make what you're saying untrue. It's still true. But what you need to remember is that when the hard times do come, well, it was true when everything was going well and it's still true now. So I'm going to make the decisions that even though it may seem scary and may seem foolish to the world, I'm still going to stay the course on what's right because I know that this is right because I know that this is what, God, what God's word says. The world was probably telling Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow down and just worship the stupid image. Just get on your knees. What's the big deal? Humble yourself. Get over it. That's what everyone else was doing. And I guarantee you there were people there that didn't think that that image was God. They were willing before that 
trial came to say, no, we're not going to bow down and worship any other God. But when they were put on the spot, they stuck with it. They stuck with what they knew to be true. And that's what we need to retain because they didn't let the fear of what can happen to them physically change their decision. They stuck with the truth. And that's why I said, we're not careful. To, I love how they answer Nebuchadnezzar. We're not careful to answer you. We don't have to like, like, wait, let's take a time out and let's think about this and I don't know what's right. We know what's right. I don't need, you know, a break to, to, to figure this out. We're going to do what's right. And we know that God's able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, guess what? We're still not going to worship your stupid God. Your stupid false God. And that's the attitude we need. We need to be able to look at these examples and say, I can have faith even in the worst situations that I have to go through. No matter how bad things may seem, how scary things may be, don't understand why it's happening. You don't have to understand why it's happening. Stay the course. You may get caught off guard, but we could take comfort that God won't let you go through more than you can handle. Romans 8.28, it's often a butchered verse, but it, it, it describes exactly what I'm describing here. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that, who are the called according to His purpose. And again, it's, a, it's talking about people who love God, people who are going the right direction, people who, who, are, who are making decisions based on what God wants and not what they want. Hey, all things are going to work together for good. When you are making your decisions to serve the Lord, it doesn't matter what's happening in the meantime, all things will work together for good. Job is probably the best example. Retaining integrity, retaining his faith in the Lord, not giving up. I mean, he felt like he wanted to die. But in the end, it still worked out for him. He received double blessings and more children. And, and you know what? It's still, you know, it's double children too because his children, I believe, had eternal life. They were probably, I mean, looking at the type of man that Job was, I bet you he trained up his children the way they should go. And when they were older, they didn't depart from it. And I believe that he trained them along up to be, to be believers. That's my belief. Obviously, I can't prove that from Scripture. But the, the way the, the, the most righteous man on earth at that time, yeah, he probably made sure that his kids got saved. Double blessings. It works out in the end. Since we know that God will have everything work out for good, we need to push ourselves to be able to go that extra mile during the hardest times and to not stop and to not give up and to not faint. Knowing that it will always be possible to make it because we know what God has already said about not tempting us above that we're able. Keeping that in our minds. Oh, you know what? God's not going to put me through something I can't handle, so I'm going to push even harder. I'm going to try to get through this because I know that I can make it. I know that I will make it as long as I don't faint, as long as I don't give up because he won't bring me to the point to where it's too much for me to handle. We're in Exodus 15. In Exodus 14, God destroys the Egyptian army that followed the children of Israel. Great victory. Exodus 15, Israel is rejoicing and singing songs and, you know, Miriam takes up a timbrel and it's this great amount of rejoicing. So much fun, huge victory, an impossible victory. The slaves against the slave owners, the slaves that, these Hebrew, the, the, the Egyptian taskmasters and their chariots and their horses and their army. But God brought the victory. God has already worked miracles in their lives, but look at how quickly their attitude changes when faced with another difficult situation. And we already saw that God was leading them another way because he knew that they, they probably weren't going to be able to handle that war very well. But look at verse number 22. The Bible says, So Moses, and again, 
Another example of a victory, now a challenge. Victory, now, oh wait, we're hitting a low point right away. Be aware of that. When we hit victories, big victories, just be prepared for a, a challenge to come up. Because it probably will happen. Verse number 22, Exodus 15, the Bible says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Remember, Elijah went 40 days and 40 nights. But these, you know, they went three days. And look, three days is still no, nothing to shake a stick. I mean, that's, that's still a serious deal. You're hiking through the wilderness, and you've gone three days, and you don't have any water. You know, it's, let's call it for what it is. I don't know about you. I wouldn't want to be in that situation. I, and I love drinking water. <laughs> water is like my favorite drink. I drink water all day long. I can't imagine going, I mean, I, I've done it. You know, I do it every one, from time to time, but like one day is enough for me. Going three days without drinking water. So they go three days in the wilderness. They found no water. Verse 23, and when they came to Merah, they could not drink of the water. So they finally get to water, right? Oh, Merah, there's water here. And they could not drink of the waters of Merah for they were bitter. The water was no good. Therefore, the name it was called Merah, and the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So then they start complaining. And then Moses goes to the Lord. God, God I need your help. Oh, we've gone three days in, in this water. We can't drink this water. What am I going to do? Verse number 25, And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in his sight and wilt give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, going to God is the right thing. Murmuring and planning is not the right thing to do. Whatever your situation is, you know, you, you, you're going to get God's wrath more often than not when you, when you complain about things. Because then it'll make you realize how good you actually had it when you were complaining. <laughs> and make you more appreciative of what he's already given you. But in this situation, he, he decides to help them. And, you know, and Moses goes to him and God hears Moses. And allows you know heals the water so they're able to drink. But what's interesting about this story is that yes, they had gone the three days. Yes, it was it was a very very tough point, and it was almost this breaking point. But when you read the next verse, if they would have just gone a little bit more, if they would have pushed themselves a little bit harder to make it through. Instead of being defeated when they came across the bitter water, if they would have just pushed one more last step, they wouldn't have had to complain. They wouldn't have had to ask, even, you know, even go to God and ask for this miracle because God already had their, their plan mapped out. God knew there wasn't water for them in Merah, but he led them that way. He knew what they were able to go through. Look at verse 27. It says, And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Plenty of water for everybody. Elam was the stop, was their destination point. If they would have just continued on and pushed it out a little bit harder, they would have had it. And this is God's plan. We can see that he plans that they can make it. He, he's like, I know they can make it from point A to point B. And here's where they can rest, and here's where they can have water, and everything will be just fine. They just have to push a little bit more. What we learn from all this, I think, is that we need to we need to be able to, to have patience. Turn, if you would, to uh, James chapter one. It's the last place I'll be turned this evening. James chapter one. When we get fearful because of our circumstances, when we get fearful of a situation that 
Maybe we've never been in before. Maybe you're taken off guard. Maybe something happens and it kind of knocks the breath out of you. Remember the Lord and that He won't allow you to go through what you're not able to handle. And maintain a steady head to make right choices and right decisions that aren't going to hurt your situation but actually help you because probably every single time you make a decision out of fear it's going to be the wrong decision. Right. When you just something just kind of like oh man what's happening oh, I don't know what to do I'll just do this. And you kind of take the easiest way out or the you know you, you, you have a tendency to forget a lot and just 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 to deal with whatever's right in front of you at any moment. And um, we need to, to build and work on our patience so that we don't allow the uh, the unforeseen things to damage us, to, to get us out of the fire, to make us to, to choose really poor choices. Look at James chapter 1, verse number 2. The Bible says, my brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, so when you when you are tempted, when you have when you have these tr these struggles and these trials, he's saying it's actually not even something that you should be upset about, even though it may not be pleasant to go through. He says, "Count it all joy, knowing this." He says, "When you go through a temptation, just know this. Remember this when the trials face you, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When your faith is tried, when you're put in the positions of going." Should I bow down or not? And you make the right choice. Your faith is tried and you come through. Trying your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. The reason why that, that trial gives you and works and builds your patience is because once you go through something, that is very extreme, maybe, and very hard on you. You get through it. Now you have that experience to, to provide patience for the next time you're faced with a difficult situation. If you quit after the first trial, you're never going to realize you could have made it through that and made it through even more. I'll read this for you. Romans 5, verse number 1 about says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. We have peace. With God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I want you to walk away this evening. Maybe you're not going through any trials in your life right now at all. Maybe everything's great. And praise God for that. What a blessing. But the time will come if you follow the path and, and, and try to live the way that God wants you to live. If you are going to continue down that path, yea, all that will godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer tribulation, shall suffer tri uh, persecution. It's going to come. It's going to happen. So to prepare for that, just know that whatever you may face, it won't be more than you can handle. God will not allow that to happen. And there is an end. And it's not going to be the worst thing in the world. It may feel like it. You may have someone wanting to throw you in a burning, fiery furnace. It worked out for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown in a fiery furnace. They were with Jesus. And, and th these are the stories we need to look to. This is the, the faith that we need to have. And, and don't lose sight of that. Rely on God's word in good times as well as in the bad times. As far as our word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the encouragement that we receive from each other as believers, dear Lord, from you through the Holy Spirit and from your words and through all these stories and, and things that we can learn.
from your word, dear God. I pray that you please give us wisdom and strength, Lord. Help us to, to make the right choices. I pray that you would illuminate our path so that we, we would know the, the right decisions to make and where you would have us to be. And Lord, we love you. And um, we just thank you for your promises. And we thank you that you're so faithful that, that we can trust that you never fail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.